we could find our seats, it's time to begin. Let's open this morning's service with a hymn from the hardback hymnal, hymn number 62. Hymn number 62. And let's all stand together. Number 62. Continue our study in 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> if you'd like to turn to me there in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> if you did not receive and would like to receive a copy of the financial statement that shows all of our expenses for last year, there are some copies back there on the, on the uh, what do you call that, bar, <laughs> the shelf in front of the kitchen. Please help yourself. <clears throat> Let's uh, pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we ask that you would cause us to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ crowned Lord of life in our hearts. We confess to you, Lord, that we are so easily drawn away from him. We're so easily distracted. We're so prone to wander and to leave the God that we love. We ask that in this hour that you would send your Holy Spirit in power that you would teach us from thy word the spirit of thy grace and cause us, Lord, to come humbly 
and yet with confidence, knowing that we have an advocate with thee, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is able to sympathize with the feelings of our infirmities and who's seated at thy right hand and who ever lives to make intercession for us. Lord, our, our sin is greater than we can bear. What great hope encouragement and comfort you give us in knowing that we have a sin bearer one who suffered the full judgment of thy holy wrath and put away all the sins of all thy people oh lord cause him to be lifted up for we ask it in his name and for his glory amen I hope the Lord will enable us to understand this morning in this first hour something of the spirit of grace, the spirit of grace. The Lord said, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above yours. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end, that way leads to death. The Lord would deliver us from our ways and cause us to bow to his way. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way. The truth and the life, no man can come to the Father but by me. Those early believers were called followers of the way. I want to know God's way, don't you? God's way is the way of grace. God's way is the way of Christ. And his word is filled, filled with his glory. And if he's pleased to bless our hearts with his spirit, then we'll be drawn to him. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. For as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up on Calvary's cross to show us God's way. Man's way is a way of works. God's way is a way of grace. And uh, this spirit of grace, it permeates the word of God. I want to pick up at the last verse that we dealt with last Sunday, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For all the promises of God are yea, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. I think I said 1 Corinthians, didn't I? Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God are yea and amen in him. Unto the glory of God by us. We glorify him in knowing that all the promises that God has made to save a people, to redeem them, to put away their sins, to give them acceptance in the presence of a holy God are yes and complete. That's what yea and amen means. Yes, the promises of God are all yes in Christ. God the Father could never say anything to the Lord Jesus Christ other than yes. How oftentimes we pray to the Father for blessings. And just like with our children, oftentimes the Lord has to say to us, no, that's not best for you right now. And so in faith we say, if it be thy will. That was never the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every prayer he's ever offered to the Father, every sacrifice he's ever made was met by the Father with yes. Yes. Father, I pray not for the world, but I pray for them which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were. Thou hast given them unto me. Lord, I pray that you would keep them. And the Father said, yes. Yes. The Lord prayed to the Father that that he would forgive those who were crucifying him for they knew not what they did. 
All those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ bore their sins on Calvary's cross were there. We were there in our sins, crucifying him and not knowing what we were doing. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Father said, yes, yes. And he said, amen. It's enough. It's complete. It's finished. All that God requires from me and from you, he finds in his dear son. And he's satisfied. He's satisfied with Christ. He's not satisfied with anything that we do. Not satisfied. As a matter of fact, he's offended. He's offended if we try to add to or take away from the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. Yes and complete to the glory of God. (laughs) This is the only message of salvation that gives to God all the glory. Every other message of salvation that man has contrived in his own darkened imagination robs from God his glory and gives man something to be proud of. Either a decision that he's made, a work that he's performed, a, 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 a knowledge that he's achieved. Man's going to pride himself in something. The gospel of God's free grace gives to God All the glory. All the glory. And so Paul begins this by saying, All the promises of God in him, in Christ, are yes, and in him they are complete unto the glory of God by us. We're declaring this gospel message. How oftentimes the scripture speaks of us. We saw that in Romans chapter 8, Wednesday night. In almost every verse for about... Seven or eight verses, he speaks of us, us, us. Um, But what the Lord has done, he's done for us. He's done for his church. And whenever there is an us, there must also be a them. Whenever there's an us, there must also be a them. Now, I want to be a part of the us, don't you? I don't want to be a part of the them. I, I, I need for the Lord to, to make me to hear, and to cause me to have hope in Christ that I could have the confidence of knowing that when he speaks and what he's done, he did for me. Now he which establishes us, us with, Christ, with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. If we're going to be established, if we're going to have a place to stand, that's what that word means. If we're going to stand upon the rock so that when, uh, whether it be the storms of this life or whether it be the storms of God's wrath and judgment in the great and terrible day of the Lord, we'll have a place to stand. And uh, he said, he that establishes you, he that puts your feet in that place, is the same one that said to Moses, there is a place near unto me where you can stand. And he took Moses and he put him in the cleft of the rock. And the only reason that Moses didn't die on Mount Sinai is because God covered him in that cleft. Oh, that's what we need. We need for him to establish us. We need, and Paul says... This spirit, of, this spirit of grace, this message of salvation is of God. It's, it's what Jonah said from the belly of the great fish. Salvation is of the Lord. If we're going to have a place to stand, if we're going to be established, if we're not going to fall, then it's going to have to be of God. And look what he says. Not only has he established us, but he's anointed us. He's He's blessed us with his Holy Spirit. That's what he goes on to say in the next verse. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Have you ever put earnest money on a piece of property or something else? Perhaps you put a down payment 
and then you decided, you know, I really don't want that, you lost your earnest money, didn't you? You lost your earnest money uh, because that was the promise that you made that you were going to buy something. And when you changed your mind, you sacrificed that earnest money. The Spirit, the, the Lord's telling us that the Holy Spirit is his earnest to us. It's the down payment. We have, we have the Spirit of God which enables us to have faith in Christ. And uh, he's not going to take it back. He's not going to change his mind. <laughs> he's not going to lose his earnest. <laughs> Unlike us, when he, makes a, when he makes an earnest, it is in earnest. Our God, with whom it is impossible for him to lie, when he makes a commitment to do something, he doesn't back off of it. And he's telling us here that this anointing of his spirit is his earnest to us. And what he's given us in earnest now, we're going to experience in its fullness one day. One day, when we shed this flesh, one day when we see him as he is, one day when we're made like him, we're going to have the fullness. He does, well, that's what the scripture says, that, that we're going to be made just like he is. We're going, to see the, we're going to see all the things that we can't see now. We have the Spirit of God enabling us to look to Christ, to trust Christ, to believe the gospel, without which we would not believe the gospel. Without this earnest, without this anointing, we have an unction from God, the scripture says, enabling us to look to Christ. I told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of the Spirit. You are completely dependent upon the Spirit of God to open the eyes of your understanding. I, 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 it's not a week that goes by I don't get more amazed of that very truth. All the listening, all the debating, all the study, all the preparation is of no avail if the Spirit of God doesn't anoint the gospel to our hearts. Had someone this week listen to me preach over 40 times over 40 times heard me preach and uh, a student of the Bible a student of theology and he told me he said I've heard you preach 40 times I've never heard you preach the gospel never heard you preach the gospel And I'm not here to defend myself. I know that the Lord's taught me the gospel. Uh, but it burdened my soul that someone could be so studious of the things of the Word of God and conclude after hearing me preach 40 times that I wasn't preaching the gospel. I take that accusation very seriously. At the same time, this individual commended me for being, um, for being such a good preacher. And I told him, I said, uh, I said, don't compliment me for being a good preacher if you don't think I'm preaching the gospel. If I'm not preaching the gospel, I'm a false prophet. You need to run from me. You need to get away from me as quick as you can. Um, but it just, it just reminded me of how completely dependent you and I are for the Lord to teach us the gospel and to open our ears and our eyes to, to see Christ for who he is. Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was a student of the Bible. He was a theologian. He was a ruler of the Jews. He, 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 he knew more than probably anybody in his day. And yet he knew nothing. He came to the Lord by night, illustrating how much in darkness he was. Oh, Lord, don't allow me to be left to myself. Give me the anointing of thy spirit 
That's the spirit of grace. He says, all the promises of God are in Christ, yea and amen. He has established us in Christ and has anointed us with his spirit as the earnest. <laughs> the earnest. Oh, we, we've got to be established in Christ. Paul said that I might be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Lord, I need to be, I need to be put in Christ. And I can't get myself there. You're the only one that can do it. And that's what he's saying. He that does it is God. And the evidence that you know that you've been put there is that you've been given the earnest of the Spirit. You're... You're not budding the gospel. You're not, you're, you're, you're amening the grace of God. You're rejoicing in Christ Jesus. We are the true circumcision. Not a circumcision that's been done by the hands of men, but the circumcision of the heart, which is done by the Holy Spirit. We are the true circumcision. Are you part of we? Are you part of us? which worship God in the Spirit. The Lord told that woman at the well, they that God seeketh those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. We worship God in the Spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence whatsoever in the flesh. How do I know that I have the earnest of the Spirit of God? God has stripped me naked and caused me to have no confidence in my flesh. He's made me to understand my complete inability before him and my total dependence upon him. Has he done that for you? Or do you think you still have something that you can do to make what Jesus did work for you? Is there a prayer you can pray? Is there a decision you can make? Is there a work you can perform? Is there something you can do? Or are you a mercy beggar? That's the difference between those who have the earnest of the Spirit. Lord, I, I, I want your Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't know if I have the Spirit of God or not. Here's one of those promises that is yea and amen in Christ. Yes, and complete in Christ. If you, being evil, that's what we are. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. Well, who of you who has a son who asks for a, a bread would give him a stone, or he asks for a fish and give him a scorpion or a serpent? Well, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because you, you want to do what's necessary and good for your children. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask Him? Oh, Lord, give me Thy Spirit. I can't understand the gospel. I can't believe the gospel. I can't discern the gospel. I need your spirit. See, this, this gospel gives him all the glory, doesn't it? It gives him all the glory. He sealed us. And when God gives the Holy Spirit, it's not, like I said, this earnest money is never, it's never forfeited and it's never taken back. <laughs> when he makes an earnest, that earnest is sealed. And what God seals, well, here's what the scripture says. What God shuts, no man can open. And what God opens, no man can shut. So when God opens the heart, no man can shut it. When God seals us up to Christ, no man can open it. <laughs> no one can remove God's people from the hand of God. This is all of him. It's all of Him. What we're doing is we're declaring what He's done in order to cause us to quit trying and start trusting. Lord, I can't do it. I can't save myself. I can't understand the gospel. I rejoice in believing that salvation is all of you. 
who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. (laughs) This gospel is a heart issue. Don't be deceived in thinking that because you can you can parrot some doctrinal truths that 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 God's done a work of grace in the heart. Um, ask the Lord to take out the heart of stone. Ask Him to make this a heart issue for you. If it becomes a heart issue for you, you'll love Him from your heart. And, uh, and you will, well, here's what the Lord said. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, what is the lust of the flesh? It's my desire for pleasure. What is the lust of the eyes? My desire for popularity, to have other people like me and look to me. What is the lust of the the pride of life? It's my desire to have power over my circumstances and power over God. Now, God said, love not the world. And when I read that and hear that, I'm thinking, I hope what you're thinking right now. I do enjoy the pleasures of the flesh. I do like for people to like me. And I'm constantly trying to trying to manipulate the circumstances of my life and to have power over myself and my and my and my circumstances. So what is this what is this love not the world? Let me tell you what it is. In my experience. And if this is your experience, you're going to say, yep, that's what it is. My hatred for the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, my hatred for it is how much I love it. That's my hatred for it. If you don't have the earnest of the Holy Spirit, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you don't have the earnest of the Holy Spirit, you're either, you're either convincing yourself, well, I don't have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. You're kind of like Job. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon a maiden lustfully. Yeah, right, Job. You're a liar, too. You know, but men do that. Well, I don't, you know, I've, I don't do those things anymore. I've, I've, I've buffeted the flesh. And power, I don't have a lust for power. God's my, God's all I need and he's all my power. And they, and they're completely ignorant of how bound up to the things of this world they really are. If you have the earnest of the spirit of God, what you hate about the world is how much you love it. Is that your experience? It's my experience. I loathe myself. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he said, For we know that the law is spiritual... We know that. But I am carnal, sold under sin. I can't keep God's law. And that's what I hate about myself. I want to have a holy thought. I can't do it. I want to produce something that's accept, that's pleasing to God, but I can't do it. I'm completely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ to intercede on my behalf and present himself for all my righteousness before God. I can't come up with anything. And I hate that about myself. And the earnest of the Spirit of God has caused me to long for that day 
when I will not know anything about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This flesh is going to be made perfect, incorruptible. (laughs) These eyes are going to be focused on him. And there will be nothing but humility and worship in his presence. No pride of life there. I long for that day, don't you? Don't you? Do you hate yourself? Now, the unbeliever is going to listen to this kind of talking. He's going to say, well, you know, you all need to have a better self-esteem. You know, you just need to hold yourself up better. Now, what, 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 what is this? They know a person who doesn't know what I'm talking about right now in their experience. If you don't know what I'm talking about right now in your experience then you need to fear whether or not you've been established by God in Christ and have been sealed with the earnest of the Holy Spirit of God. Or if he's done that, this will be your experience. Turn with me back to our text. Moreover, verse 23, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Now, Paul's writing a second letter unto the Corinthians. The first one, he had to deal with some very hard issues, some very difficult things that were going on in the church. And he dealt with them in a spirit of grace. And he said... I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come, um, and, and and chastise you. Um, I'm going to wait, and wait for the Lord to do a work of grace in your hearts, convincing you that what I told you is true. And that's the spirit of grace. You know the. I, I hope I'm learning a little bit about what it means to wait on the Lord. I I think I am, just a little, just a little. (laughs) I mean, in my younger years, I was so quick and impetuous and so, so, you know, controlling over my, and and the older you get, the more you realize, you know what, every time I put my hand, it takes a long time to learn this. Uh, But you, you learn the older you get, every time I put my hand to something, it gets worse. It just gets worse. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, you know, I, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not to Corinth. I didn't want to come and put my hand to it. God inspired me to write to you words from God. And I sent them and I'm waiting on God to use his word to convict you and to convert you. And I'm not going to come on my own and put my hand to it. What a, what, a, what a blessing that God would give us that spirit of grace to wait on him and, uh, and, and to believe that, that his spirit is sufficient, his grace is sufficient, his word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to divide asunder the, the soul from the spirit and the bones from the marrow and, and, and expose the intents of the heart. Do you believe that? That's what faith, faith just believes God. Oh, Lord, I've got such a spirit of works in my flesh. I've got such a, a, a controlling uh, uh, spirit about me. Give me the spirit of thy grace. Enable me to wait on you. And don't misunderstand me. I, I, well, I put my hands to so many things even now. I, I feel like in many ways I haven't learned a thing. Um, but I do think that as we grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, uh, the Lord gives us some understanding of what Paul's talking about here. I call God for a record of my soul. God's my witness that I came not unto you to put my hand to the word of God. I sent you God's word and believed that God 
would use it and that that would be sufficient. And it was. It was. Look what he says in verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. This spirit of grace doesn't seek to take dominion over one another. You know, there's so many reformed, Calvinistic uh, churches that are so big on elder rule and church discipline. You've got to submit to the authorities of your elders, and the elders are meeting on a regular basis, trying to figure out who they can crack the whip on. And uh, that's what Paul's saying here. I, it, I didn't want to come and, and pretend to have dominion over you. If you've got to, you know, in any relationship, if you've got to demand respect, it's because you don't have it. If a man has to demand respect and submission from his wife, it's because he doesn't have it. If a father has to provoke his children to wrath, it's because he hasn't convinced them by grace, by the spirit of grace. Fathers, provoke not thy children to wrath. Don't be hard on them. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, the scripture speaks of servants and their obligations to their masters. Serve them as unto the Lord. And then he says to masters, this is, this is bosses over their employees. This is, actually, this is actually slave owners to their slaves. So we can translate it that way as well. Masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing your threatenings. Don't threaten one another. Forbear your threatenings. If you feel a need to threaten, just back off. And, uh, and that's what Paul's saying. I, you know, he, I mean, he was an apostle. He had the right to go there and crack the whip, and he said, not for that we have dominion over your faith. We don't have dominion over you. We're not here to, 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 to try to control you or intimidate you. We're here to preach the gospel, that God's grace would be sufficient for your every need and that his grace would cause us to submit one to another and esteem one another more highly than themselves. If you believe yourself to be in need of grace more than anyone else, then uh, that doesn't give you the moral high ground to stand in judgment of anybody, does it? Galatians chapter 6, if a brother be overtaken with a fault, you which are spiritual, and that's every believer. It doesn't mean you which are living a life of superior spirituality. You which are spiritual, that's everyone who's been sealed with the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, whether thy'd also fall. We, we, never, we never look at anyone's fallings and think, well, I couldn't do that. That's, that's not the spirit of grace. Lord, I'm capable of that and a whole lot worse. And the truth is that I, that I do those things in my heart all the time. The person who accused me of not preaching the gospel, I asked him, he said, he said well, well, you don't call men to repentance. And I said, well, what is repentance? And he says, it's turning from your sin. And I asked him, I said, uh, I said, well, tell me which sin in particular you've turned from in your life. He wasn't able to answer me. You see, the natural man thinks sin is nothing but a behavioral problem. When you have the earnest of the Spirit of God, you know your own heart. You know the deceitfulness of it. You know the wickedness of it. You know how much you love this world and the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and all that's in the world. And, and, and you know you haven't quit anything. Not in your heart. 
We're not advocating immoral behavior. Paul deals with that in the next chapter. We're not advocating that. We're confessing before God that we're sinners. That we're sinners in need of God's grace. And Paul said, I I didn't come to rule over you. I didn't come to exercise dominion over your faith. But are helpers of your joy... For by faith you stand. (laughs) What is your joy? What is your joy? Most folks' joy is the absence of conflict in their life. Well, I'd be happy if this situation and that situation and the other situation was different, then I'd have joy. As long as you're looking for that, for your joy, you're never going to know anything about the joy that comes from the Lord. Our joy is knowing that all our sin has been put away. Our joy is Christ. He's our hope. He's our access to God. And if I've got him, tedious and tasteless the hour is when Jesus no longer I see. Oh, if I've got him, then prisons, palaces be. Isn't that what we sing? Prisons, palaces be, if only Jesus were with me. He's my joy. When, when Paul and, and Timothy were in that, in that uh, Silas were in that uh, dungeon of a prison in Philippi, they'd been beaten, chained to the wall, and in the middle of the night, midnight, what are they doing? Are they weeping and wailing and complaining and crying and, oh, God, why is this happening to us? No, they are singing for joy. With with open wounds, they're singing for joy. The Spirit of God comes, delivers them, and, and the very man that caused those wounds, that Philippian jailer, he mended them didn't he Lord saved them (laughs) and uh, he dressed their wounds oh Lord look what he says but we are helpers of your joy how do I help you to have joy how do you help me to have joy tell me about Christ tell me who he is Tell me what he's done for me. Somebody else this week said, well, you know, every time I've listened to him preach, every time he preaches, he just preaches the same thing. I take that as a compliment. He just preaches the same thing. This person's looking for me to give him something to do. You know, just if you want to be a helper of my joy, tell me about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell me who he is and tell me what he has accomplished. For by faith in him, I stand. Whatever whatever God has ordained, if he gives me faith, I can stand. Oh, the spirit of grace is when God enables us to help one another in our joy for me to tell you about Christ you to tell me about Christ us to rejoice together about Christ I'm so encouraged with our men we we, we have the men get together on Monday nights um, been doing it now for a few months every other week or so over at our and and I just I just stand amazed that we can have 15 20 25 men get together for three four hours and 90% of the conversations about Christ. <laughs> I, I just, I'm so thankful for that. That's the spirit of grace. When sinners are able, by the earnest of the spirit, to look to Christ and to show one another who Christ is. All right, let's, let's take a break.